Okay, good morning, committee. Uh, we're on the record. Um, first up this morning is we have Northeast Kingdom Day, and we have uh, a lot of my fellow people from the kingdom in with us this morning to talk to us about what's going on in the kingdom. And uh, I'm really pleased that the turnout is. Uh, like I just said, we don't get out much, so uh, when we do get out, we, we go en masse and we go and make sure people hear what we have to say. So I appreciate everyone coming down today. And uh, Jody, uh, you're first up. Thank you for coming down. We uh, It's always a pleasure to, uh, to hear from you. All right. Well, thank you very much. My name is Jody Freed. I'm Executive Director of Catamount Film and Arts. And I'm also the president of the Northeast Kingdom Collaborative. So I wanted to kick off today by just a general introduction to the day and what we're trying to accomplish um, and an introduction to our organization. So um, thank you to you um, and to the committee for having us. Um, we, as Mike said, um, look forward to the opportunity to make the trip over here and for our voice to be heard, which often I think gets lost in a rural mountain in the Northeast Kingdom. So. Um, NEK Day is an opportunity for all of us to celebrate the innovation um, and all of the exciting work that we're doing over in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, we're doing that in the context of a um, declining workforce and some real challenges, um, but we're working really hard. Um, and this is the second Northeast Kingdom Day, um, and last year we came here for the first time for the inaugural event, um, and we laid out for you some um, very specific focal points. Uh, one was around the intersection of the creative, recreational, um, and local food and beverage economy, um, and that being a place for us to find um, uh, synergy and for us to leverage economically and as a community and to create vibrancy. Um, and then the second piece was for us to uh, work on leadership and that in the Northeast Kingdom, um, as in much of Vermont and across rural America, there is a void that needs to be filled as the experienced leaders are um, aging out of their positions, um, and we need to make sure that we have a strong group of leaders to step in and take that torch forward for us in the Northeast Kingdom, and we recognize that. And so we um, have done a lot of work in the past year, I'll report to you. Um, I'm not gonna go into all the specifics, but on those initiatives, we, um, raised a significant amount of money um, and we um, and funding and resources that we brought to bear through the institutions in the Northeast Kingdom and we've moved forward on those initiatives and made a lot of progress and you're going to hear from different people over the course of the day um, in regards to those specific projects um, but we, we have made a lot of progress um, so the NEK collaborative just to give you a review of that um, it's a um, convening organization for the Northeast Kingdom. I've been involved since 1999. I think it's well over 20 years old. Um, it's an organization that's um, made up of sector leaders. So we have CEOs of hospitals, presidents of banks, presidents of university, um, it, it, right across the board, municipalities, um, health and human services. All of those different sectors are represented by the NEK Collaborative. Um, and then we have advisory, an advisory group which is rep made up of philanthropy and government agencies um, that also um, has a non-voting a non role in that. And we're led by Catherine Sims, our dynamic um, and awesome executive director. And that organization works to convene and facilitate um, solutions in the Northeast Kingdom. We do not implement them ourselves, and that's a really important clarification. Um, we bring people together and from all of those different sectors, um, we facilitate conversation and connection, and then um, we create a, a strategic framework that then the individual institutions and organizations within the region move forward um, in terms of the implementation. Um, so that's a very important clarification in terms of what we do. Um, we brought today to this room a group of witnesses that you're going to have the pleasure to listen to. Um, we have Sean Tester, CEO of Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital. We have Nick McClure, owner broker from Century 21 Farm and Forest. We have Evan Carlson, entrepreneur in residence at Due North, Due North Co-working Space at Northern Vermont University. 
Um, we have Joe Kasperzak, town manager, uh, or assistant town manager at St. Johnsbury, the town of St. Johnsbury. Brian Kane, sales and marketing director at the Capitol Plaza Hotel and an MVU alum. Luke Sussdorf, manager of special events at Jay Peak Resort, also an MVU alum. And Molly Vesey from the Old Stone House Museum in Historic Village. <laughs> Each of them will give testimony to you um, regarding the initiatives and the work that they're doing in the Northeast Kingdom along these lines. So now I'm going to pivot really quickly and talk to you about the creative sector because that's the hat that I wear. Um, and I spoke to you guys, what, a week and a half ago at the Travel and Tourism Day. Um, so I'm not going to bore you with the same presentation and the same stuff, but I just want to highlight a couple of different areas. Um, one is that the creative sector is extremely important and in addition to the role that play in the Northeast Kingdom at Catamount Film and Arts, I chair the Vermont Creative Network and in the Northeast Kingdom almost 9% of our workforce is somehow involved in the creative sector. That's over 3,000 mm -hmm. jobs. Statewide it's similar numbers over 40,000 jobs. It is a significant contributor to our economy but I think even more importantly um, what has come up, and we've done a bunch of research in the past um, two years that I referenced to you guys when we met, um, whether that's the studies we did through the collaborative, the white paper we did with these nationally known consultants um, in terms of the creative economy, or even the research that came out through the National Governors Association, and if you guys haven't read this, you should, it's online, um, but it's the um, Rural Prosperity Through the Arts and Creative Sector, and, and this is a guide to um, this on a, a, a more macro level. And so what has come out and is very clear from all of that research is that as, as we move forward into the next generation, as we move forward um, into the future and we look at workforce development and economic development, um, that the, there's a, 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 what I call the special sauce, right? Um, and that recipe is, we've, I brought it up before, it's creativity, recreation, and food and beverage. Um, th those three in that intersection. Um, but then there, there's the other pieces of it, which to me all kind of um, evolve around connectivity. So that could be the broadband connection um, and having internet connectivity. It can be housing and transportation. Um, the next generation of workers are not as interested in owning cars and they want to live in a closer together. And as you read through this, this idea of connectivity is really, really important, that we need to be considering um, as we look at housing, as we look at transportation, um, as we look at our basic infrastructure needs, we need to be considering this in order to complete that recipe. We're very well positioned, and I think that that's the exciting news, because we have strong creative arts and culture, we have strong recreation with our mountain biking, our skiing, our hiking, and everything, and we have perhaps the best local food scene in the whole country, if not in some places the world. Um, so we, ha we, we are well, well positioned for that, and if we can add those other ingredients, then based on all of this research, we'll be in a position um, to, to not only be competitive, but I think to be a leader throughout the country. Um, with that said, there's three focal points for today specifically I'd like to mention. Um, one is the importance of NVU, um, Northeastern, Northern Vermont University in Linden, um, for us specifically, although Johnson as well, um, with their combi the combined campuses. Um, and the importance that the university plays specifically through the lens of the creative economy. Um, we need that university in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, it, it's interwoven into everything we do. Um, we, on the Catamount it, specifically, we have anywhere from 10 to 12 interns over the course of the year that are working for us through their business industry program, learning sound and lights. They're the kind of the roadies that allow us to do the shows that we do. They're the um, they're working in our business office and our box office through their business administration program. They're doing our graphic design through their advanced graphic design classes. There's satellite ga galleries that are being set up. There's co-working spaces. Um, Northern Vermont University is interwoven into the, in, the basic fabric of the Northeast Kingdom. And as we've looked at what's happened with the um, small colleges throughout the rest of Vermont and some of the Greece enclosures, um, and what the impact that has had on very specific towns. Um, what I would suggest to you is just realize that this is, th this is an entire region 
and that for our rural area, the footprint of um, NVU is 30 miles in all directions, and it, it is playing a tremendous role in the um, in our ability to compete. So, um, the most creative individuals are the individuals that are of college age. We need them there. <laughs> um, if we're going to move forward with this prescription as laid out for um, rural prosper prosperity. The second piece I bring up is the working lands and vibrant downtowns. Um, I, I was really happy to see, and you guys have probably seen ACCD's um, community, inv or, um, community investment package that they put out and the, um, some of the placemaking um, stuff. I, I think this, this is a nice framework and anything we can do to invest in the vibrancy of our downtowns again because the work co-workers in the future are going to want to be close to their villages. We have to have vibrant downtowns and housing down there and amenities for them. So these investments in vibrant downtowns are critical. And then the second piece of that is as we look at the working lands, I know this, this session, um, we're going to have some conversation around Act 250, um, and that is a very significant issue for us, and I'm telling you that through the creative lens, but, and while it may not impact our projects directly, the indirect impact could be huge. And by that, we work with Kingdom Trails, Burke Mountain, Jay Peak, Memphis Magog Trails, all of those are our recreational partners. They are the ones that are critical um, for us in terms of audience development and, and they bring that to the special sauce, right? Um, and if in the Act 250 conversations we're not sensitive to the issues that those specific rural entities bring to the table, um, I think we could um, really put ourselves in jeopardy. And so I, I would ask of this committee that as those conversations move forward that we make sure specifically those recreational entities that are in those rural towns that they get to, their voice gets to be heard and that the unique, um, the unique chemistry and ecology of private landowners and the fragility of that is part of the conversation as we have those Act 250 conversations. Um, and then the last piece is along the line of um, just a change in paradigm. Um, and I'll just throw this out to you as a, the traditional way people have looked at arts, culture, and creativity has been through the lens of um, it, amenity, right? It's something that it complements tourism. It, it's, it's a nice thing, it's an amenity. Um, and I would challenge you as we move forward into this new world that we're headed towards, we need to start thinking about creativity from the standpoint of basic infrastructure and investment in basic infrastructure. So the one great thing about creativity is you can sprinkle it on any other sector and it's a fertilizer. It helps it grow, it helps it thrive. And so as we think about return on investment, as we think about what we can do within our communities, we should be looking for ways to build out that basic infra infrastructure and go away from it being siloed as an amenity to this is a basic infrastructure that makes all of the other things in our community better and more vibrant. And I play a game sometimes with our staff and sometimes when we meet, we, we do community engagement exercises where ask people to th just throw out ideas, you know, manufacturing, this, that, and, and we'll tell you how, we'll throw out a, a way that we could make that better, more vibrant. And it's amazing, we never get stumped. You can go through a list and you can say, okay, manufacturing, I want an engineer to come to town. Well, have them attend first night when you're recruiting and let them see, you know, 250 musicians playing in 18 venues over the course of eight hours <laughs> with the best possible artistic quality that you can imagine. And let me tell you, they're going to look at moving to that area a little differently. <laughs> That's a real life example, by the way. We've had two, I know of two individuals that were doctors and engineers that moved to this area because they attended first night. And, and I can go line by line and, and you guys could throw examples at me and that basic fertilization process is the same. It makes it better. So as you think about from a commerce and an investment perspective on the state, start thinking about um, creativity and the creative infrastructure um, through the infrastructure lens. That's what I got for you. Thank you, Jody. If, if you could, um, if 
you have links to those reports, absolutely. Could you send them to Amy and we should place them on our web page? I will give you a lot of information. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So next up, um, I'm going to pass the torch off to Sean Tester, CEO of MDRH, and. I'm going to excuse myself, I apologize, but I'm headed to Los Angeles to meet with the Levitt Foundation about our Dog Mountain music series, and I have to be on a plane at 1 o'clock. Um, so I would like to, my perspective is really coming at you from the lens of workforce and the challenges and opportunities we have around workforce. And I know that this is not a new subject for all of you, but I thought I would start, you guys may have received a, uh, a, a handout. I don't have copies, but it's just to help frame the conversation. I'm looking at this through the lens of healthcare as the leader of Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital and my four years experience at Northern County's Healthcare, the network of FQHCs serving the Northeast Kingdom. <clears throat> and to just put it in perspective, so these are stats from 2019. In 2019, NVRH used 23 traveling nurses. Do you all know what a traveling mm -hmm. nurse is, right? Mm -hmm. It's okay. Um, which is a very expensive solution to a workforce challenge. We used 11 locum providers. So those are physicians, NPs, PAs, um, who we bring in to fill critical positions when we lose a provider or have struggled to fill a position. Um, the good news is, over the last year, we filled 119 new positions at the hospital. But with the retirements that we're struggling with and just normal attrition and turnover in our workforce, at the end of December, we had 64 open positions. To put that in perspective, we have a workforce at NBRH of about 640 people. That's 10% open positions, right? And that's that moves a little bit throughout the year, may have had a low of about 45, and then it climbs back up, and we're averaging around maybe 50 throughout the year. 35% of my nursing workforce are baby boomers. 35%. 24% of them are millennials. That's the wrong, are millennials. That's the wrong ratio, right? When I stepped into the role as the leader of NVRH last year, people asked me, boy, what do you think your big challenges are? And I said, well, we've got three big challenges. Number one is navigating healthcare reform. We are, we are in the midst of a massive transformation of how we pay for and deliver healthcare services nationally and at the state level. And that trickles down to this hard work we're doing locally. We're going from a fee-for-service model that is very transactional to a value-based payment model where, where we're paid for taking care of the overall health of the population, number one. Number two is our demographic challenge. We're getting older. You know, I used to tell people, I think Vermont is the second or third oldest state in the union. Does that sound? Second. Well, I've heard it's moved, hasn't it? Yeah, thank you. And um, the Northeast Kingdom is the oldest region of the state of Vermont. I've heard it's Wyndham County, so it ships around That may shift around too. I've been using these stats for a while, so. I just say we're old and we're tired and we don't have time to check the math. Um, <laughs> But the reality is, when people get older, they need more health care. And what we're seeing at NVRH is that people are coming to us, they're older, they're sicker, and they're more complex. The good news is, we've done a very good job of helping people stay alive longer. But when they come to us, they need more care, and it's more challenging to care for them. At the same time, we have a declining workforce. And that's reflected in these numbers. And that's the third challenge that I want to say. It's the workforce. It's really hard to do healthcare reform when you don't have the workforce to do that hard work. It's really hard to shift the, to the evolving payment model. It's really hard to refocus on the social determinants of health. The things that we know, if we can start affecting them, housing, financial security, access to nutritious foods, mental and physical well-being, it's hard to focus on those if we don't have the workforce to do it. Of those three challenges, the one that keeps me awake at night is workforce. Now, 
I do feel like we are really pushing hard, we're pushing the envelope within our ability at the hospital to address those challenges, right? Over the last couple of years, we've held steady on our employee contribution to benefits, right? Over the last two years, we raised nursing pay by an average of 13%, okay? We are trying to be very innovative in how we reach outside our borders to attract new people here. We have a partnership with NCIC. They got a grant to go out and attend um, job fairs at uh, military bases throughout New England, or outside of New England to try to uh, tell them the great story about the Northeast King and the great opportunities that we have here. <clears throat> we have also dramatically expanded our own loan repayment programs and tuition reimbursement programs. Part of that is to say, hey, we have amazing staff. We want to grow that talent. How can we grow them professionally while they stay employed at NVRH? We're doing some really great things there. The challenge is also, you know, I'm speaking through the lens of healthcare, but these same challenges are reflected in many of our colleagues in other industries throughout the area, whether it's manufacturing, um, my friends in the banking in industry are, are looking at the very same challenges. This, this goes beyond just healthcare. Uh, education, I just saw uh, Brian uh, Carroll in the hallway outside and he was talking about the challenges of finding and retaining talented teachers to, to meet the evolving needs of the education system. Um, and I would like to just touch on why this is connected to these big issues that the Northeast Kingdom is facing. So NVU, NVU does play, as Jody said, a critical role in the fabric of our community. About half of my IS staff are NVU graduates, okay? That, that has been a tremendously valuable pipeline for us, right? We have people who come join NVRH who are not yet going to college they can work in NVRH and take classes in NVU to further their career and to build their ability to contribute economically to their own families as well as to the community and serving the patient population through their education there. Um, Jody talked about the value of the arts. <clears throat> there are some great resources in our community that really help us when we try to attract talented people from out of the area. So his example of the first night experience for a physician is one example of that. With the rich experience people have with the arts here. Kingdom Trails, incredibly important. It may be our second best, right behind St. Johnsbury Academy, our second best um, recruiting tool in the area. People love those resources. And they give you a lot of business with injuries. <laughs> well, <laughs> that might be true. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and then the third thing um, is around Act 250 is uh, t for us it really ties back to housing for our workforce. <clears throat> housing is a real challenge in our area and um, anything we can do to encourage development of workforce housing will help us when we attract people to the area to find housing that meets their needs at all levels. So, you know, we need higher end housing for, for uh, providers, physicians, people who, who can afford that, but we also need great workforce housing for the nursing staff we hope to bring in, for the lab technicians, for the uh, diagnostic imaging professionals, all the people that are the lifeblood of the hospital that help the hospital run, right? Um, so there are some things that we could use some help on, and uh, these are just some ideas. Like I said, I think we're looking at this, okay, what can we do ourselves, and then what can we look to our partners to help with? Um, you may have heard talk about a um, potential tax credit for uh, healthcare professionals. You know, that's, that's one tool that may help us better recruit. Another one is just the continued support for loan repayment programs through AHEC. Um, unfortunately, the state of Vermont is uh, one of the lowest um, 
um, has the lowest amount of money provided through those programs. And I got to tell you, my years recruiting, you know, as the leader of an organization, when you're recruiting, especially physicians, you're intimately involved in those conversations. And usually there are two questions that come right off the top of, uh, of the hat. Number one is, what's the quality of life there? Notice it's not, what do you pay? And number two is, what's your loan repayment program? Mm -hmm. And if the answer to number two is, well, you know, it's okay, or you don't have a good answer to that, the next thing that happens on that phone conversation is a hang up, right? These people are coming out of school, medical school, professional school, with so much debt mm -hmm. that they need the help and they're looking for employers who can provide resources to help them pay off that debt. Um, there is a bill, and I'm not sure where this sits right now, but it's S-125, it's the Interstate Nurse Licensure Compact. Um, anything we can do to make it e reduce the barriers, make it easier for uh, licensed professionals in healthcare <laughs> or other industries to work in Vermont where they're licensed elsewhere will help smooth the path to their employment here, right? Um, so, so, so that type of legislation is critically important, and it's low cost, right? That's like that's just a kind of, for me, it's a no-brainer. And finally, um, we could use continued help um, to attract foreign-born workers. So mm -hmm. we've partnered with a company called Avant, um, and what they do is they bring in nursing staff from other other countries. I think we have four on staff right now. I know two of them are from the Philippines. I think one is from Puerto Rico. I can't remember where the fourth one is from. Um, and, and the way their program works, it's kind of like a long-term temp to perm. So they're like two and three year positions. They come into our community. They really establish roots. And the goal is for them to then become permanently employed at our institutions. It's a little bit less expensive than a traveler. They establish long-term relationships, which is much better for patient care. But the, the goal is that they then transition into full-time employment so they help address our workforce needs. We could use help. The problem with, with bringing in foreign-born workers is it's, it's, it's legally, it's, it's, kinda, it's a web, it takes a long time, and it's expensive to navigate. Anything we can do to help ease that process of bringing foreign-born workers into our workforce will help us. Um, I think there has been talk about establishing like a statewide hub to help with that, and that would go a long way. So uh, I know I'm way over my time. I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to tee up Nick. I did talk a little bit about workforce, and I, I mean uh, housing. And maybe you can pick up from there. Sure. All right. Great. Sean, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sean. Just so you know, we we have we are zeroed in on workforce. And I know we, you. Are. We were at the Green Mountain Care Board's panel discussion on on workforce and primarily <coughs> primary care docs, but also nurses. Last year, we passed a bill out of here that. Uh, required OPR to do a study on the issues with getting nurses, getting um, uh, clinicians uh, in the clinician part of nursing to get more uh, availability of those Education. nurses to be able yes, to teach. Yes, that's a huge, and so that's the hu biggest challenge we, for us. We did receive that report back and it's on our website. Um, I invite you to look at it if you haven't, but pretty much says that we've over-regulated. <clears throat> And so um, we're hoping that we're going to bring the licensing board in and just have that discussion with them so that we can get more nurses into the pipeline. That's great. That's what we need. It's really about building the pipeline. It really is. One real quick thing. What about reciprocity for nurses? Don't you have reciprocity with other states? <clears throat> um, I'd have to double check. Let me look into that. That may be what the... That's the I think that's what S-125 yeah, is. That yeah, I think that's what that would yeah. do. Yeah. Great. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Understood. Hi, how are you? Good yourself? Good. So Nick McClure, broker owner, Century 21 Farm and Forest up in Derby. Happy to be here. Happy to be present with all you guys that are doing hard work to support the Northeast Kingdom. Um, I've been in the real estate industry for 20 years. Uh, excited to be here. We're having great success in the Northeast Kingdom, but we're also having some struggles. So here to kind of share some of those. Um, in general, the real estate market's been fairly strong. Nationally, it's been amazing, strong seller's market. In the Northeast Kingdom, we kind of have three segments, um, each of which have, has a different market. So the what I would say the lower uh, end market up to, I would say, 150 for in-town high quality homes and 200 for country homes uh, is definitely a seller's market. We're lacking that supply 
Um, when we get into the middle range, I would say, you know, the two to 300 range, it's a fairly stable market. Uh, when we get in the upper range, 300 plus, it's definitely a pretty strong buyer's market. Um, I, I seem to focus most of that on lack of high paying jobs, but Sean's telling me very differently. So um, it, it's kind of nice to see that we do have that and maybe um, we, the jobs are there, it's just getting the people here to, to support those jobs. Um, since 2016, our inventory sub 200,000 has been reduced by 50%. So that's been a huge uh, reduction in inventory. <coughs> Part of what has made our market strong, and we've had a lot of transactions because we've had inventory when other areas haven't, but that's certainly getting absorbed. Um, We've got a few projects in Newport, which cer certainly could use support. Uh, I was happy to, to hear that you know, part of Governor Scott's uh, budget plan was a, a million and a half dollars allocated to downtown Newport. Um, I think that could, would, could be huge in positively impacting downtown Newport. Um, I've worked with the receiver, Michael Goldberg, um, and I understand at one point there was a trade proposal to trade that downtown property for some other properties that the state had control over. Uh, it seems like a great solution to me that's not out of pocket for the state. The receiver can then sell those other properties, uh, but it would put that staple down piece, uh, piece of downtown Newport in um, the state's hands, and hopefully they could leverage that into an opportunity to grow the downtown Newport. Um, so I would love to see you know, all of you participating and encouraging that conversation. You know, I don't know the inner details of it, but I think it, on the surface, seems like a, a really good solution. Um, we also have the uh, former Bogner facility, uh, what was going to be the ANC Biotech facility, which is vacant. Uh, we'd love to see a new company in there bringing jobs, bringing workforce, new company or a growing local company. So anything that you folks can do to support those endeavors would be awesome. Um, different topic, but oftentimes when we get people moving from outside the area, uh, the question is, how's the internet? Um, you know, if you're in a downtown area, it's generally pretty strong, but when you start to get out in these country locations, it can be quite poor. And when we're trying to bring people that are maybe working remotely, um, it, it's been difficult to get those people into a country location. So we might have a, a family from Boston that's fed up with city life. They can work remotely so they can be in Vermont. They want a country home, uh, but when they get up here and their speeds are, you know, five megabits per second and they just can't work remotely, it, it impacts their decision. Um, so it would be great to see some, uh, some resources brought to increasing the internet uh, capability of the area. Um, I understand the NEK Collaborative is working to address that through a communication union district, so I think that's wonderful. Um, so. The NEK is many things, but one thing it's certainly not is Chittenden County. Um, <laughs> while some regulations, fees, processes might make sense in Chittenden County, they're not all economical in the Northeast Kingdom. So, you know, when you're looking at uh, offsetting the costs of permits, engineering, wetlands delineation, energy audits, stormwater ret retention, um, to your average home price of 350,000 in Chittenden County, it's doable. But when uh, we're dealing with an average home price of 160000 it's just not economical to add all those things on top. Um, we know you all know that and appreciate your support in you know, trying to make things as efficient, streamlined, and inexpensive. Uh, we're seeing very little new land development just because of the, the high costs of developing. Um, there's been a few properties in the Northeast Kingdom that you know, they, they've been developed, developers spend a few hundred thousand dollars getting them ready to build on uh, and end up getting frustrated with a, with the state and selling them for half of what they've invested. Um, it, there's, there's less and less ready to build land available. So seeing some investment in infrastructure, whether it's, uh, you know, downtown or outside would, would certainly be instrumental to help uh, promote those avenues. Um, I also just last night received the community investment package, which Jody referenced, um, which I think is a great start to addressing many of these issues. So hopefully people are looking at that and considering some of those uh, solutions. Questions? I want to 
wish we did. We had time for that. But I appreciate you coming down. Thank, Thank you, you very Thank much. You. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. I just want to thank you all for taking the time to meet with us. Um, I'm Evan Carlson. I'm an entrepreneur in residence at Due North Coworking in Northern Vermont University. Uh, Due North Coworking is an office space, a resource hub, and a, a, a community for remote workers, startups, and small businesses uh, in our rural pocket of Vermont, the Northeast Kingdom. Um, we're 1,800 square feet in the old Bag Bomb building in the Civility Center of Lindenville. And we opened our doors just over a year ago on November 15th, 2018. Uh, <clears throat> as a venture of the Center for Professional Studies at Northern Vermont University, our space is excellent for uh, professional development, and we do a lot of promotion of the different type of programming that can be offered to our <coughs> co-working members, but also to the broader community, and see our space as an excellent place to be able to uh, serve those types of programs. Um, but in addition, we're also uh, a conduit for introducing students to the concept of remote working. Um, and our space, the university, as well as the businesses working at Due North, create this ideal intersection for career opportunities. Um, this is, uh, you know, for example, with the, some recent, two recent graduates of NVU were hired on by Northview Weather, a startup working out of Due North. Um, and are now at the space every single day. And so having that direct pipeline of talent is a really unique feature of the space that we're offering. Um, and we expect to see more of that trend over the next couple of years. At the core, Do North Coworking and co-working spaces uh, in general rent space. Um, nice spaces with uh, amenities that are you know, hard for freelancers, remote workers, and a lot of small just, uh, small businesses to justify paying for. Um, as a small business owner, we can be that one-stop shop for the rent, for uh, or one, one payment for rent, internet, utilities, coffee, printing, um, and that allows them to really focus on the business at the core, not focusing on the actual facilities that they're trying to manage. Um, at Do North, we have two primary focuses. Um, one is making remote working possible uh, and an option in rural Vermont. As Nick pointed out, it's very difficult to find high-speed internet in a lot of the rural uh, households, uh, especially in the ones that are ideal. Um, today, we have 25 members that are actively working out of the space. And for these members, we are access to high-speed internet. We are the 17th building in Caledonia County to have 100 megabit per second uh, symmetrical internet service. And that comes with a pretty hefty price tag. So we're paying $640 a month for that internet service. That same internet service mm. is available in Chittenden County for $55 through oh, Burlington.com. Um, that is our second highest line item, uh, uh, aside from our rent. But this story is not unique just to Lindenville. This is the same for rural co-working spaces across the state. Um, aside from that, members uh, find our space as a productive work environment that can be difficult to find at home. Um, and we're also a community for people that are working remotely. If you're a trailing spouse new to the region, it can be hard to kind of integrate. Um, in addition, we have had, uh, we had a recipient of one of the remote workers' grants uh, take advantage of our space. And um, they're new to the area, didn't have a ton of friends. And so this was a way for them to be able to have a soft landing coming into the community. Um, in most cases, these remote workers are bringing in higher wages, uh, sometimes significantly more than what the median household income is for the region, um, and that means more tax dollars. This has a direct economic impact, not just in our community, but at the state level. Um, so the second thing that we're focused on is building a strong entrepreneurial ecosystem in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, for most entrepreneurs, time is one of their most valuable commodities. And while Vermont has amazing resources for small businesses, um, it can be a pretty daunting uh, task for a small business and time consuming to determine where to go to get help when they need it. Due North and other rural co-working spaces across the state are aiming to be the on-ramp for these small businesses. Um, not only do we have, uh, not only are we building communities of entrepreneurs that can share stories and talk through challenges that they have in their small business, uh, but we can also be uh, a resource to help them navigate the, ch the different resources available for small businesses in the state. Um, so in addition to being on-ramp, we also facilitate a lot of entrepreneurship programming. 
Uh, in 2019, we hosted 72 hours of programming um, with uh, amazing partners like Vermont SBDC, the Center for Women and Enterprise, and Launch VT. Um, in 2020, we have uh, another calendar stacked full of different programming, um, community-focused stuff as well as entrepreneurship stuff. And um, you know, we really have a, a bunch of other ambitious goals in the next couple of years to hopefully move the needle in our, in our rural economy. Um, this includes some things like collaborating with local high schools to introduce entrepreneurship programming at the CTE or in the CTE programs, um, as well as the development of industry-specific specific, uh, business accelerator programs. So, looking at uh, accelerator programs for the forestry industry or for the ag industry, um, accelerator programs for outdoor recreation, um, and you know, we really see rural co-working spaces adding this energy to communities where it's needed most. And to move the needle in the long term, we need to ensure these spaces are, can be rooted for the foreseeable future. Um, so I guess the one ask I had to the committee is I would encourage you to look at what other states are doing to support co-working spaces. Um, and also, uh, I would invite you all to take a tour of spaces across the state, specifically rural co-working spaces. Um, and that we would be happy to help set up uh, an opportunity for you to visit these different places. Thank you very much. I want to make sure to leave time for NVU uh, to testify here, especially as I'm a graduate. And I certainly know how important that is. Uh, to our area. So I'm Joe Kasperzak. I'm the assistant town manager of the town of St. Johnsbury. And uh, I want to start with the good, what's going on in St. Johnsbury, what's helped us get where we are now, and then talk about our challenges. And I'll comment briefly on the connectivity that Jody mentioned, because I think as a representative of a municipality, that's part of the work that we do. And that's the arena we live in when it comes to infrastructure development and providing services. Um, right now, we have about $18 million uh, of development going on in our downtown. Uh, much thanks to the designated downtown program operated through the ACCD, uh, who leveraged $800 plus thousand dollars to help make that go. Um, that development includes the iconic downtown New Avenue Hotel that's being renovated by Housing Vermont, a great partner, and their partners, and they're starting construction. They're underway, actually, and remediation will start construction this spring. So that's a, an iconic structure for us and a really a, a benchmark development project. Uh, we also have uh, a new distillery in town. We've got three new restaurants. We've got the old glove factory that the St. Johnsbury Development Fund is sinking close to a million dollars in to revitalize that building. Um, and we've got a new brewery opening any day now. So. Uh, there's a lot of optimism, there's investment, uh, we're pleased about that. Um, on the flip side, you hear this all the time, I'm sure, an aging, declining population with uh, declining household average incomes. Uh, we have got increased costs of essential services, so when you graph that, we're basically on a collision course here that we need to deal with. Um, Hence our discussions about regionalization, which is new. And as we try to solve our problems, we're embarking on a discussion with our outlying communities about fire services. We'll discuss dispatch services, some real challenging discussions that we feel that are really important um, and need to happen. And when we say regionalization, we all know we've seen education try to consolidate the expenses. It's a tough, challenging topic. Uh, people are proud of their independence in their communities, uh, but we look forward to the discussion. It's a, it's a hard problem, and we're going to roll up our sleeves and try to work on it together. And thanks to NVDA, who's taken the lead, Northeastern Vermont Development Association, on, on facilitating those discussions with other fire departments. Um, Jody mentioned the creative economy and the outdoor recreation economy. They are definitely demand generators. These are economic drivers for our community. These are things that we need to focus on. We need to really turn our community into uh, a destination for this experiential tourism piece. We believe that that's uh, the new opportunity 
and of course that restaurant and food industry sector is so supportive to that uh, outdoor recreation and creative economy piece. So we work uh, collaboratively um, with many on that topic. Um, we're working with the collaborative and other communities on procuring grant funding at a larger scale uh, for a larger regional piece. Uh, that's another important piece uh, of what we think will be the success of our region. And also, we've just entered into the communications union district as we look to help solve these issues of broadband access. So um, this connectivity piece, we, we're, going, we're going nowhere without working together to solve some of these big issues. I hear clearly the workforce piece, the housing piece. I work uh, daily on housing topics. In fact, we have embarked on our own code compliance and inspection program for rental housing. I'll be interested as the state reviews some of the legislative language that they're working on. There's a bill about the state operating a registration, a housing registration and an inspection process, mm -hmm. how that impacts communities that already have that in place. Uh, in fact, we've taken revenues from that housing registration and developed programming uh, to provide grants to landlords and property managers to reinvest into their properties. Uh, which is an important step for us. Um, and so uh, I, I'm very curious about how that piece of legislation goes through. Um, and lastly, we work with partners on a daily basis, USDA, Vermont uh, Community Development Program, uh, US, I mentioned USDA, Vermont Housing Conservation Board. There's too many to even name. Uh, NVDA, NCIC, USDA, I mentioned, ACCD. These are all important partners for rural communities and I ask when we you know we pass legislation that we we use our lens on this rural community piece because it's really a challenge Thank you, Joe. All right. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Luke Sussworth. I'm the manager of special events at Jay Peak, and I graduated from MDU Linden in 2012. Um, I first discovered MDU Linden through my father, William Sussdorf, who, like me, is a Linden State College alumnus. Um, I worked as a certified snowboard instructor for a number of years and attended Adirondack Community College near my hometown of Diamond Point, New York, where I graduated with an associate's degree in liberal arts. And I had an interest in learning more about an industry that had already had such a positive impact on my life. And um, I wanted to see if I could turn that into a career. And NVU Linden was the vessel that really turned that dream into an attainable reality. Um, from studying general resort operations to more specialized programs like lift maintenance, grooming, risk management, each, each class that I studied while at NVU Linden flowed from one to the next. Um, it was a great small classroom learning experience that offered so much insight into all the intricacies that go into operating a successful ski resort. Frankly, I couldn't get enough. Uh, while at NVU Linden, I had the opportunity as a student to intern at a number of different resort properties in New England, shadowing frontline employees, supervisors, managers, directors, um, and even in some cases, resort general managers. I now manage JP Peak Resort's internship program with NVU Linden, and it feels great to give back to an institution that helped kickstart my career as a resort operator. It's also been a great opportunity for the resort to recruit new employees from NVU Linden. As a final requirement to graduate with a bachelor's degree in science in the field of ski resort management, I had to complete a summer long internship at a resort property, and I chose JP. Peak. As the JP Peak intern, I worked in a variety of departments. Um, you name it, I likely did it. The front desk, food and beverage, parking and security, the pump house indoor water park, uh, housekeeping even, and eventually made my way onto the events and marketing team where I've been since the fall of 2012. I've been the manager of special events at Jay Peak since the fall of 2014, so I direct the year-round on and off snow event series for the resort, and I also coordinate the Jay Peak music series, and much more. Anything else our general manager wants to throw on our plate. Um, I found a second home in the Jay area, and I'm forever indebted to NVU Linden and to Jay Peak for helping make that possible. I mean, the opportunity that I had, it's opened doors in my life that uh, frankly, I never knew existed. Um, not to mention lifelong friendships 
and countless great days playing outside. Um, Jay Peak is also where I met my now wife, a fellow Jay Peak employee, a native Vermonter, and an NDU Linden alumnus. Uh, my sister-in-law has this plaque in her living room that reads, if you are lucky enough to live in the Northeast Kingdom, you are lucky enough. And now officially li living in Vermont full time for almost a decade, I honestly couldn't see myself anywhere else, especially living in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, the quality of, of life that we as Vermonters possess is something very special. And in my case of being a native New Yorker and now being converted Jay, um, I'll be forever indebted to NVU Linden and to Jay Peak for helping set the stage of a lifelong career doing what I love in an environment that I love. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> it is snowing a little bit. We we'll believe we have Nolan Atkins up next. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Brian sends his regrets. He is out sick, so I'm, I'm stepping in to, to share, uh, I think, broadly what NVU is attempting to accomplish um, in our region. Um, my name's Nolan Atkins. I'm provost of the chief academic officer at, at the institution. Um, and so I'm going to actually share just an excerpt of the written testimony that I provided the, the committee, and will be very, very brief. Uh, NVU combines nationally recognized liberal arts and professional programs with hands-on, high-impact experience tailored to the working world. Students participate in internships, and you've heard examples from NVRH, uh, co-working, uh, JPEAK, and, and, and uh, Catamount Arts uh, this morning. Um, they participate in travel, collaborative research throughout their college career at NVU. Um, a couple other examples include conducting research uh, to understand how ski areas are adapting their services to reduce their environmental impact. Um, our atmospheric science students provide weather forecast information to the Vermont Agency of Transportation, or VTRANS, to help maintain safe roadways throughout Vermont and have done so for the past 15 years. Um, we really value the hands-on experiential piece. 95% of our seniors participate in an internship or practicum as part of their studies. And the feedback from our community partners, and you've heard it this morning, has been very positive. We really value the combination of liberal arts and high impact or practical experience. Um, and it results in success for our students as, they've been their, or as they begin their careers. They have developed the essential soft skills that employers demand, the critical thinking, the creative thinking, communication, problem solving, teamwork, and collaboration and research. These are all transferable as they move from one career to the next. As employers are able to hire the staff they need for their local businesses, whether it's a bank, resorts, health and human services agencies, schools, law enforcement, uh, weather agencies, and more. Mm -hmm. We can continue to work closely with local businesses to offer programs that meet uh, their workforce development needs. And let me just give you an example here. We've recently uh, created the Center for Professional Studies, and Evan referred to it earlier. Uh, the Center for Professional Studies develop, or delivers boot camp style training to meet the complex needs of adult learners and is a valuable option for mid-career professionals seeking additional training and certification. Classes like data analytics, project management, Microsoft skills provide workforce readiness that is in high demand by employers across all industries. Employers or employees really like the, the smaller, the bite-sized uh, learning uh, pieces, so certificates, badges, and so on, in specific skill areas and the customization that we're able to provide through the Center for Professional Studies. Um, institutions that have benefited from this training include Kingdom East Supervisory Union, Mobile Medical Corporation, Revision Military, Mount Snow, Burke Mountain, and Smuggler's Notch um, are all institutions that NVU has recently worked with to address their workforce training needs. Um, and additionally, we continue to work closely with local businesses to offer programs to meet their workforce development needs as well. So again, in the interest of being very brief, um, that is where I will end. And just uh, thank you all for your continued support for NVU and the Northeast Kingdom. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you.
Okay, so my speech takes exactly three and a half minutes, so we should be good. <laughs> uh, my name is Molly Basie. I'm the executive director of the Old Stone House in Brownington. Thank you all for hearing my testimony today. A little interactive. Um, how many of you know about Alexander Twilight already? Show of hands. Well, that's a pretty good show of hands, actually. Um, you may know that he was an educator through the mid-1800s in historic Brownington, where the old stone house now stands. You may have heard, in fact, that Alexander Twilight essentially built Athenian Hall, the four-story granite building that would house both girls and boys from 1836 to 1858. You may even know that Alexander Twilight served in the Vermont State Legislature. But what is all too little known was that Alexander Lucius Twilight is, was of African-American descent. His father, a freed black man who fought in the Rev Revolutionary War. Alexander Twilight was the first African-American to graduate from a U.S. college, Middlebury, in fact, and was certainly the first African-American to walk these very halls as an elected official. Alexander Twilight was an impressive force of nature, highly intelligent. He was a powerful teacher and preacher at the Orleans County Grammar School and Brownington Church. He employed what is modernly described as place-based or experiential education techniques. Alexander Twilight was enigmatic and magnetic. He was driven and visionary. He manifested all of these attributes in his teaching. And over the span of his educational career, and I think this is especially fascinating, Alexander Twilight taught almost 3,000 students, nearly 1,000 of them women, young women. Um, since 1829, the Old Stone House has been a positive economic force in northern Vermont as well. Mr. Twilight himself attracted students from all over New England and from southeast Canada as well. We remain, as a nonprofit ourselves, an attraction to roughly 2,500 visitors per year uh, through guided tours, school groups, events, and programs. At the Old Stone House Museum this year, the 225th birthday of Alexander Lucius Twilight, we are working to celebrate this outstanding Vermont human being. Alexander Twilight is most definitely the hero of our story at the Old Stone House, but he was also a major and prominent protagonist in our state's history as well. With the continued support of funders like the USDA, the Vermont uh, Division of Historic Preservation, the Preservation Trust of Vermont, the Vermont Humanities and Arts Council, uh, and partners with other cultural and recreational organizations like Northwoods and Catamount Arts, as well as the Fairbanks Museum, we hope that our celebration of this amazing man will establish a basis for residents in, North, in Orleans County to understand its diverse and complex history as well as instill a sense of pride, a pride of place, actually, for all Vermonters visiting the Old Stone House. Our stories of success will hopefully provide a template for other historical museums as well, and houses in Vermont who wish to more deeply explore the diverse history of which they may not have previously been aware. Please join us at the Old Stone House Museum this year in recognizing one of Vermont's most compelling sons, native sons, on September 20th. 2020, and as Twilight himself said, onward is the great motto of the universe, which extends to all parts and to every individual. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just want to thank everyone. I want to thank everyone for coming today. Um, it's always a pleasure to hear from you. Um, maybe next year we can set something up so that we can ask some questions too. Um, I have a very curious committee. And uh, they like to ask questions, and I'm sure that they're um, not happy about having to be quiet. This um, just to let you let you know a little bit um, about what we've done. Um, the communication junior district actually came out of this committee years ago when we were charged with telecommunications also. So we're not, we don't do telecommunications anymore. So that's upstairs in the new committee, Energy and Technology. But what we did swap for was workforce. So we are doing a lot of workforce now. Um, also, I'll let you know that Representative Dickinson sits on, is a trustee on the State College Board. Um, so um, I'm sure she's heard all the testimony about NVU, and uh, we'll uh, take that with her back to the board also. Um, Act 250, 
um, upstairs that's taken mm -hmm. care of uh, in natural resources, uh, fish and wildlife. They have purview on Act 250. So I hope, um, I know that I think Abby is going up there today to testify about um, the issues with the Kingdom Trails and that they're having with uh, Act 250. But I hope others like Nick uh, have an opportunity to let them know um, the effects of Act 250 and how we need to try to get things uh, straightened out there. Housing is in general housing military affairs. That's their purview. But we all work, we work together because they're all commerce issues. So um, although they, they look at we get a chance to generally look at things too. So once again, thank you for coming. Enjoy Kingdom Day.